In this episode, we'll be looking at service design in the outcome economy, using service design to explore new ventures, and finally, what does service design look at speed and scale? So if you're interested in that, keep watching. And here's the guest for this episode. Hi, I'm Pete, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi all, my name is Mark Fontijn and welcome to the Service Design Show. If you want to create more impact and change the world for the better as a service designer, then you've come to the right place. Because here on the show, you get the chance to learn from the success of some of the world's best service designers. We talk about topics ranging from design thinking, customer experience, organizational change, and creative leadership. If these are the topics you're interested in, be sure to know that we bring a brand new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So if you don't want to miss anything, click that subscribe button. My guest in this episode is a true service design pioneer. I'm super honored to have him on the show. He's the co-founder of the IXSD Academy, which is all about delivering disruptive innovation. His name is Peter Fossick. For the next 30 minutes, Peter will be talking about what does service design look in the outcome economy? Why are companies using service design to explore new ventures? And what does service design look at speed and scale in the era of cognitive computing? If you prefer to listen to a podcast version of this episode, head over to servicedesignshow.com slash podcast where you'll find this episode and all the previous ones. But remember, here on YouTube, you'll get content that isn't available as a podcast. That was it for the introduction. And now let's jump straight into the interview with Peter. Welcome to the show, Pete. Hey, how are you? I'm, I'm great. Thanks. Uh, awesome to have you on the show. We had a little chat before the episode and you've been industry in, the, in this industry for so many years. Do you actually remember the very first time you got in touch with the term service design? Yeah, I, I think um, the first time I remember using it as 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 a as a way to describe um, an approach to transforming and innovating with services was probably with Chris Downs, and and we we mm. we knew each other because I taught Chris Downs at Glasgow School of Art, and Chris came to see me where I was teaching. Uh, I was teaching at Middlesex University, and he'd set up this new um, consultancy called Live Work with Ben Reason and those guys, and. Um, we were kind of dis, you know, discussing this whole approach to the way um, design um, from a human-centered and, and people-centered perspective was um, becoming more and more important in the context of services and transformation. So I kind of got it from him, really. And um, hmm. so that was about 2007, I think, something like that, 2008. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So that's when I really kind of grappled with it as a phrase. But we've been talking about holistic design for a long time, even since the days of Glasgow, when we were looking at design thinking. And at Glasgow, working with Norm and McNally, we were you know, talking to Stanford about how design thinking can impact business transformation. So even then, we were grappling with it back in sort of 92, 93, yeah. 92, 93, yeah. That, you know, that, that's the nice thing about the show. Everybody sort of says at some point, moment, I just realized that it had a name, what I've been doing for many years. Yeah, yeah. So I think for me, it was about 2006, seven. Yeah. yeah. You gave me some three super interesting topics, and let's just dive uh, straight into them, right? Are you ready? Yeah, sure. All right. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the first one, and it's up to you to come up with the question, right? So make it really hard for yourself. Um, yeah. The first topic is the outcome economy. Do you have a question around this? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's how do we design services and add value in the outcome economy? Um, one of the things I'm interested in and I've noticed is that, you know, as we've gone through this process of digitalization and increasingly what used to be analog experiences around products and interacting with physical experiences, whether it be spaces or with products, we're now in a position where we've moved to value in use and it's about how you deliver an outcome. And I think as designers, it's one, how do we um, enable that value to be understood? And how do we deliver at a point of production often in a service uh, ecosystem? And then in the outcome economy, it's moved away from even providing services like, oh, we'll, we'll hire you the drill bits or we'll hire you the drill like in the share economy, you know, let me go down the road yeah. and, and, yeah. and borrow the drill. So now it's really, well, what's the outcome? Ultimately, I need to get to get to get a really good set of holes drilled and, and maybe, um, 
you know, very precisely. And it's the outcome that I'm paying for rather than the service. Um, and of course, let's be honest and, and be frank, you still need to use a service and you still need to use products and so forth. But I'm, I'm much more interested in that value in use or value in outcome. So it's shifting, I think, away from value in use to value in outcome. Um, and that might, you know, I don't want that to be, a, you know, kind of just semantic wordsmithing. I think there's a, a distinction. You know, when you're using something, you're interacting with it. Um, I might not be interacting with it. You know, I might not be interacting mm -hmm. with parts of the process. So I think, um, you know, we're moving away from a traditional way of, of value and exchange in products and, and value in use and services to the value around how we, we get an outcome and a value, uh, you know, delivered benefit, so to speak. What does this mean for designers? Well, I think for designers, we've got to grapple with a lot more moving parts. Um, it's not just about um, designing touch points and looking at how um, we might uh, bring together different channels to communicate. And it's not just about looking at processes and interactions. I think increasingly it's about redefining the way business turns up. It's about mm. redefining the partnerships within those businesses so increasingly we talk about ecosystems and I think it's also about what we've understanding what people value um, and, and, and as a designer that means using some traditional approaches to design or what we might call traditional approaches to design which are um, you know, people centricity and working yeah, with users yeah. and doing research but I think yeah. increasingly we have to be a lot more savvy about business and a lot more savvy mm. about technology. And that plays back into the whole kind of design thinking model um, with, with business technology. So, you know, feasibility, viability, as well as desirability. And I think that's a core. I mean, I always see that as a core, but um, I think, you know, if you, if you get involved in business, you realize that business people think in a very different way compared to say technology people, compared to designers. Yeah. And I yeah. think, you know, we, we have to be able to understand how business um, propositions are shifting and changing as much as how um, the tech changes, as much as how people's behaviors change. And any, any clue, what is, what is pushing this? What is creating momentum towards that outcome economy? Why now? Yeah, it's a good question. I, th I think the momentum comes from the fact that um, increasingly it's less about um, holding and owning um, capital and capital mm. products and assets and it's much more about delivering a value and I think you know the classic example and it's quoted you know we talk about Airbnb Airbnb doesn't yeah. own any hotels it delivers a, it delivers a service but increasingly the outcome is about well I want a great experience and I want to be able to you know do this in a very seamless way in terms of payment, booking, and so forth. But they actually don't have any physical assets. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think you know, you know, digital technologies are informing this. And the shift towards the outcome economy, again, is it doesn't really matter how you get there as long as you can deliver that benefit. And, and I, more and more stuff is becoming, uh, or more, more and more aspects of that service ecology are digital and hidden and not so visible. And we're seeing a shift towards um, non-human intervention in the way things are configured and delivered. And that's the, you know, the era of cognitive computing, which we'll talk about maybe a bit more later. So I think yeah. there's a number of different factors. One is the etherealization of products and services. Two is the increased uh, role of digital. Three, uh, um, supporting that is the notion of um, value and benefit where it's needed. Um, and increasingly less about owning physical capital, um, in, whether it be machine plant or whether it be um, physical things like buildings and or people, employees. Um, and I think we've seen that th those, th those, those kind of patterns and that vectoring um, occurring over the past 15 to 20 years. And we're at this kind of sweet spot now where it really is much more widespread, much more um, accepted. Um, and, and, and of course, people are, are more savvy, digitally savvy these days, you know, with, with whether, whether they be millennials or even baby boomers. We're a lot more used mm. to using these technologies, they're more connected. And um, so we're able to deliver outcomes in a different way. And final question regarding this topic, you know, um, it, 
what is there to design for someone? You know, service design is already so holistic, so complex, and people are questioning what are you actually designing. Uh, yeah. You know, in the outcome economy, it becomes even uh, bigger and more holistic. Yeah. What is there to design? It's a good question. It, I mean, I, I think, you know, first of all, I think service design often is less about designing and more about planning or orchest mm -hmm. orchestrating. So I think... Orchestrating, yeah. Yeah, I, I think often you can, you can, you know, design is, is it, it covers a multitude of sins. It's a broad church, isn't it? Uh, what do we mean by design? Whether it's a, a yeah, process yeah. or a mentality or an activity, it's, it yeah, can be a noun, yeah. it can be a verb, all that. I think service design in terms of um, it's it, it, the fact that it's often dealing with a lot of complexity. What's left to design? I, I think this is the challenge, isn't it? Because mm. we're seeing an awful lot of value add coming these days from the things like cognitive and data analytics. Um, you know, back in the 90s, there was a lot of value add around CAD and being able to man manipulate um, three-dimensional um, analog forms and do that very quickly and speed to market, lean production, that sort of thing. And then, with mm -hmm. and then with digital, it was all about how information could be shared quickly and efficiently. And now it's about how we can analyze that information and, and um, understand and infer around the complex nature of information, infer new insights and, new, and, and, and deliver new, um, as it were, outcomes. Yeah. So I think yeah, that that's, yeah, yeah. there's, there, there, it, it, it is shift, it shifts, it shifts and moves depending on where the technology is moving or where the value add can be, can be, 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 be provided. Hmm. All right. Topic number two. Yeah. Topic number two is called venture as a service model. And do you have a question related to this? Yeah. So, you know, why, why is, um, service design, um, being used in, in venture as a service, um, and why is that becoming important? So I came across this, I guess, um, when I was working in Australia, and I did some work with Boston Consulting Group Digital Ventures, um, which I was very impressed with their, their model of bringing design as um, and, and into the entrepreneurial or venture side of um, service architecture. So, you know, Boston, mm -hmm. Boston Consulting, um, traditional consulting model service as a fee, um, you know, senior partner comes in with a whole bunch of people and they charge by the hour of the day for a project and they provide consultancy, expertise, knowledge and strategy. And then yeah. what I saw with, with people like Boston Consulting Digital Ventures was this idea of um, taking an open innovation model, a lean startup model, and using service design along with other design skills and tools and business thinking and, and technical thinking to um, invest and put your money where your mouth is. And service design was a big part of that because when you're designing a new business, a new organization, a new venture, you need, I, I feel that you're really designing services. Um, and so service designers were taking on an important role in businesses like that. And I think we've seen that increasingly over the past three, four, five years with people like Ernst Young and Accenture buying Fjord and so on. You're seeing that, that, that shift of, uh, of thinking, um, a, a shift in practice and a shift in, in, in offering. But I think the big distinction with ventures as a service is you actually go in in partnership and disrupt, yeah, and yeah. disrupt by circumnavigating the legacy culture and systems in order to, 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 to kind of invent the new business that is able to move at speed and scale at speed because it's not encumbered with legacy culture, legacy systems. And I find that very exciting because it's often harder to ch turn the tanker than it is to build a new speedboat and race ahead of it, mm. yeah? Um, but yeah, of course, yeah. it, every, at some point, every speedboat, if it gets successful, grows and grows and grows into this like larger, more difficult uh, thing to steer. So, um, you, you know, it's part of that whole kind of product cycle, you know, kind of you, you reach your peak at the apex and then you come down and something else comes along. But I kind of like this model, venture as a service, yeah. So, you know, I, I think I recognize this with a lot of our projects and uh, I think a lot of people watching this episode also recognize this as you, you go in, you do a project, you see all kinds of opportunities that you would like to act upon as a service designer, but you see that the company, the organization isn't ready for it yet and you would really like to partner with them and, you know, let's take this on and let's make this a success. 
but the company is holding holding back. You know, how how do you bridge that? So how do you get companies to actually adopt this kind of model? What do you need from a company? Mm -hmm. And not from the consultancy company, but from the client yeah. perspective. I think that's a great question. And, and it's one I, I mean, as, as designers, I'm, I'm sure we'll all recognize that. Um, every company is at a different stage in terms of its willingness to accept that it needs just needs to change. Cri I think crisis is the key. <laughs> crisis is the key catalyst there, which makes people focus and Chris and, and kind of um, you know precipitate around a particular need to change. Yeah. And and I think until you have crisis, you don't change. Uh, and right. it takes that unless you're very smart. And I think there are companies like Netflix. I think Netflix are really good at changing and adapting. And, you know, I remember by... That, that's baked into their culture probably, Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And I think this is the key thing. You just mentioned the C word, culture. And I think it's a cultural issue. You, you, doesn't, you can throw as much design and strategy and, and ideation at something, but unless the culture is willing to behave in a way that enables change... Um, and people mm. behave culturally in a way that they uh, um, embrace discomfort and risk and have a growth mindset where they want to learn and yeah. change, then, yeah. Uh, yeah. Then, then, then you're not going to, you're not going to be able to implement any form of, of innovation. And I, I and, and I well, think some businesses are better at others at it. And, and it, it is culture. And I, I love that, that, that expression, you know, culture, each strategy every day, all day. Um, yeah, yeah. So you know that's a key thing, culture. But I, I think we've got two C words: a crisis. It's either a crisis or it's culture, right? <laughs> well, well, I think culture often creates crisis, and then you realize you've got to change. You know, and I, I think, I think for me, um, mm. that can that can come at a time where you you realize, wow, you know, we, we need to do this, and we still have time to do it. And other times, it's too late. So I mean, I, I used to work. Um, in, in North London helping small businesses innovate and I realized very quickly that there were two types of companies those who were embrace of a change and willing to change and those who just didn't have the capability to and you know what some companies deserve to fail and, and, and that includes large, yeah, yeah, yeah. large corporates who we, we hold dear to our hearts they're just not capable of changing fast enough or quickly enough in their culture not so much in their organization but in their culture and I think we, we're seeing that increasingly with incumbents, large, you know, traditional blue chip co companies, whether it be in a sector like financial services or IT. Yeah. yeah you know, you've got so much experience. Have you seen, um, you know, a, a culture uh, or a crisis is maybe something that we as service designers cannot uh, uh, create, or maybe we can, who knows. But, you know, <clears throat> what... Have you found anything that helps to move these kind of organizations? Or do you say, you know, you're not ready for this yet. I come back whenever you are. Um, yeah, I've seen it. I, I, I think, I mean, I, I have tremendous respect for those in a company who are pioneering new approaches the way we work together and use design and use innovation. You know, not everything can be solved. Not everything's a design problem. Not everything can be yeah. solved by designers. Sometimes we'd like to think we can, but we can't. And you know we what? We often do. <laughs> yeah. And, and I've been guilty of that often where, you know, or this is, you know, you, you, know you, ha you have this feeling that if we just spend enough time working on this, we can solve it. Um, I have tremendous respect for those in companies who are pioneering um, new practices, helping the company transform. And I think increasingly we'll see service design playing well, it does play a big role in that. And we get involved a lot with, with HR, with human resources. We get involved a lot with people who are building new teams, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I always used to say to students when I was teaching, look, you know, there's things you can, you can solve as a, in your capacity as a civic person with your vote. And there's things that you can solve as a designer. And there's things that you have to solve sometimes with a big, large baseball bat. <laughs> um, and, and you got to you got to cho choose which hat to wear and, and which tool to use, whether it's the pen or the sword. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe we we should be practicing using the the, the baseball bat more often. Who knows? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, sometimes you want to, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and it it will probably speed up things. You know, decisions. Is it a yes or a no? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Topic number three, and this one is awesome. You've presented uh, in the, uh, uh, at the Service Design Network conference in Madrid, right? And I think this third topic relates to that. Um, and it's called the era of cognitive computing. So um, what is your question? That's a big one. It's like, well, I mean, for me, it's how, how might we deliver service design at speed in the era of cognitive computing? And, and I think you Let, can... let's first start at the end. <laughs> what is the era of cognitive computing anyway? Uh, uh, it's a great question. Uh, and it's, and it, it, it's, again, <laughs> a very broad church. So, I mean, cognitive computing can refer to uh, machine learning, um, artificial intelligence, um, mm -hmm. robotics. I mean, it's, it's a pretty broad range of different areas. And um, some companies like IBM will refer to cognitive computing. Other companies might refer to machine learning. But it's this idea that we've got smart machines that are able to process, process data very quickly and learn. Um, and we have companies like Google and IBM, where I used to work, and um, my, uh, Microsoft and, all, all, and Toshiba. All these companies now are exploring um, how cognitive turns up as, a, as an offering and how mm. the next stage of the era of computing is around cognitive, having moved from programmatic and tabulated into into now into now the 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 era of big data and, and small data and how we actually analyze and, and and teach machines how to how to learn and think so it's cognitive really covers that and i think one of the one of the things we're seeing increasingly is what we call ambient intelligence turning up so it's it's quite invisible it's all around us um, and machines are working at such a great speed now to handle such large amounts of data that humans can't possibly be involved in the process. So I'm interested in how design turns up, particularly service design turns up, and, and how we, we deal with things like uh, people-to-machine interactions. Obviously, people-to-people, -people, we're kind of covered off on that. We kind of understand that. It still has its challenges, but you know, we talked about culture, but how do we de how do we deal ourselves into the game where it's machine to machine talking and working and designing? And we're seeing assisted design. Well, I mean, CAD um, in terms of three D design has, has had assisted design for some time, um, and there's things like you know chip manufacturing and design where a human being can possibly deal with the complexities. It's all done by alg algorithmic um, machine learning and so forth. And then what we're seeing now is like Adobe with its creative cloud using AI to do assisted design around things like video editing and so forth. And we're seeing this happening more and more. Um, um, and it's, I think we're, we're on this cusp of a new era. Um, and, it, and it's in some sectors, it, it, it's, it's maturing faster than others. But I think this is the era of cognitive computing. And the challenge I have as a designer is I turn up in a room um, with me, me post-it notes and me pens, and <laughs> and and the reality is, is that the machines are doing it all by themselves. It's like, well, I'm, yeah. am, I, am I am I relevant? I mean, I'm using analog tools, born out of an era of analog design where we were dealing with design thinking in the context of, say, designing products. Which you know, back in the '90s, mm -hmm. you know, that's where we started adopting these processes. We didn't have information at our fingertips mm -hmm. about users and their behaviours. Um, um, we we had to do interviews and we had to do workshops, and yeah, I'm seeing yeah, I'm seeing yeah. more and more that that data is everywhere, and that data is being continually collected, whether it be geolocationing, behavior on you know, declared data around searches. So all this data is kind of there. Now we have to think about how we turn up and our value as designers, um, and and even it's being processed really fast by these machines. So you know, there's a question there about how do we deliver innovation through service design and design thinking. Um, in this era of cognitive computing, you know, it seems so. It, it, it seems so far away, but uh, at the same time, you know, we all understand that lawyers will be replaced by uh, AI. We understand that doctors, for a lot, for a big part, will be replaced by AI. But we see ourselves as a design community, the creative ones. You know, AI will never be able to replace us, right? Cognitive computing, yeah. and and and. Now we're talking, you know, that we don't, do we have to do interviews? Is that part of our work? You know, the, the analyzing, synthesizing information, is that part of our work? Huh. That becomes really scary, right? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a really good, really good kind of a couple of key issues there, which I'll just unpack for a minute. One is we're seeing <laughs> the white collar workers, professional classes being disrupted. So lawyers as a profession, you know, had a lot of power and control, could charge large fees because they, they had to, cons um, 
uh, in, in be imbued with large amounts of, 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 of knowledge, very acquisitive knowledge, and, and, and they would hold that, and they would use that knowledge to do with complexity. So increasingly we have computers that can do that. So the question is, is do we need lawyers? Um, and there's lots of people out there going, yes, let's get rid of the lawyers. You know, But, you know, I mean, it's the same thing in financial services. Do we need people to, to put trades in? And if we have it algorithmic, uh, 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 you know, using algorithms and programmed yeah. and machines learning and then, you know, an anticipating change before it happens, you question what role do we play? And it's the same thing with design. Anything that uses heuristics, rules, and arguably design is about rules, and, we, we, you know, we generate our insights through analyzing information that we acquire. Now, machines can do that. And at the same time, we can then use design heuristics or design principles to say, well, look, you know, with this content and with this type of image and video, we can lay out a web page in this fashion. Um, you would say, well, why wouldn't you put that into some form of algorithm and why not use you know, let a machine do that? And we are beginning to see um, applications mm -hmm. and platform as a service offerings around, for example, mm -hmm. web, which do that for you. Um, mm -hmm. There is all this, but, you know, I, I'm going to bring this back down to, to, and hopefully, you know, all the designers out there going, no, no, no. Um, I think the reality is there's something remarkable about the human brain, the way it works. And I was working with my daughter last night who is studying design at college. And she was, she was working on a campaign around um, sexual health for, for teenagers, which, you know, something that um, interesting topic, challenging topic. And there's something we did is that we were, we were messing about with some ideas and she got some fruit and she, she put it on a page and she wrote something around it. And it was the physical act of doing that that spurred off an idea that she took a picture of the notebook with the fruit on it. And, and it was a chance happening. It was that serendipity. And I think that's something that's very hard to replicate in computer systems is serendipity. And, and I would always encourage people, you know, I think part of creative thinking is that kind of juxtaposition, that unusual discovery, because you're, you're physically interacting with pen and paper, which I think is really important. And she was saying, oh, that looks really cool. The style of the calligraphic writing that she'd written, the fact that she had a, um, a piece of fruit there with some um, mm, a, a, con mm. a condom and all. It was, it was the chance happening, you know? And, sh and she said, that's going to be my poster. You know, and I thought that was great. And that's the serendipity that as humans interacting with our environment and with each other that occurs, that's really important. Can't really replicate that in a computer. Right. So coming back to your question, what role does service design play, play in the, you, you mentioned speed in the era of uh, cognitive computing. Yeah. How, how could we summarize that? Well, I think, I think service design along with some of the other design practices around UX, UI, have to, have to work out ways of being more expedient and faster at working you know, around agile. Yeah. So we've seen now, we've got DevOps, um, now we're seeing the emergence of design ops. Uh, or, uh, some people call it DesOps, some people call it design ops, but design operations where we systemize and operationalize our approaches. So we're not kind of reinventing the wheel every time. We've seen a big shift away from the wow diagram. Um, increasingly around agile we're using user stories and we're trying to take those stories and use those as a common currency we're seeing assisted design which can help us work quicker with workflow we're seeing connected workflows through tools like slack and we're seeing that with these amazing range of uh, tools um, which allow us like virtual reality so again service design is not just about digital and um, we're also about the narrative of space so things like vr and ar and how those connect together and how we work with other teams so i think you know increasingly it's going to be about focusing on things like the, the synthesis and creative space it's going to be about um planning perhaps around um how we can exploit serendipity um but i do think i mean i haven't got the answer i do think that we're going to see some significant changes with the way and the creative and cultural industries turn up to deliver value. And mm -hmm. service design, I think, is, is playing a big role in dealing with these complex ecosystems. But increasingly, we'll see these ecosystems able to connect and share information and share viewpoint and work together in more collaborative ways. And I think part of our, our job as designers is to look at how we can, can, can reinvent ourselves somewhat by, by looking for opportunities to add value. And I think that's going to be coming back to things around things like language, semantics, identity, things like that. Um, but I, you know, I haven't got a clear answer. But it's a very exciting time to be a designer, as as always. <laughs> it's a, uh, there's a lot of changing. That's 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 good. 
Yeah, Peter, I know you haven't pre uh, prepared for this question, but I uh, asked this one to everyone and I give the opportunity to everyone. People are watching and listening to this episode. Is there something you would like to ask them? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really interested in how they're how they're working together in this 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 new era of of you know always on instant data um, in this era of agile. I'm interested. I'm very interested in how they they work uh, speed speed and scale um, and 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 what kind of hacks and cheats and best practices mm. they have. And, and and you know maybe they can share with us what their vision of the future is because I think it's an, it's it's always important to keep one eye on what's happened before and one eye what's happening ahead you know yeah. um, and yeah. and and, uh, and try and you know anticipate where where change is coming or maybe what we do is we invent that change uh, so what how are they how are they inventing this change yeah. how are they doing it and that and, and that, that's that's exactly what the show is also for you know looking into the future and then backtracing from there yeah yeah definitely definitely. So yeah, um, answers on a postcard, please. <laughs> or in the comments down below. Yeah, sure. Pete, thanks so much for giving us a little bit, uh, an insight in what's happening in your mind at this moment. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Oh, uh, LinkedIn, just connect with me on LinkedIn. Happy to have a chat on Go there, ahead. you know. I, 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 right. I, I, I wish I could say Snapchat, but I'll leave that for my teenage kids, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. LinkedIn, it is. I, okay. I'll, I'll put the links down below in the in the show. So right. thank you for your time. Thanks uh, for being here. And now it's time to wrap up this episode. Fantastic. Thanks for the invite, Mark. Really enjoyed it. And carry on. Fantastic show. So what are your service design hacks? Share your thoughts and ideas down below in the comments. And remember, more people like you are watching these episodes, and your comment might just be the thing that helps them to achieve their next meaningful breakthrough. If you would like to learn more, check out some of the past episodes or head over to learn.servicedesignshow.com where you'll find courses by leading service design experts that dig deeper into the topics we talk about on the show. That was it for this episode. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in two weeks time.